Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. All right. Nothing much to say here. Uh, this is part two of my conversation with Harold Neal aboard Cassiopeia 2. Definitely uh, check him out uh, on Facebook. He's going live all the time. And uh, also, you can check out his website. Link in the description. Here we go. Thanks for listening. And must it have felt amazing. So, there you go. We spent a year in Key West fixing up the boat yeah. and getting her going, and we sailed away. And all of the schooner captains in Key West were so helpful. They taught me. I got to audit their celestial navigation courses. Again, they you know, helped me learn to splice, helped me learn to do all these things so I could make my way. They were so excited that this young couple had come along to save Cassiopeia. Yeah. And were actually, you know, the kind of dreamers that show up in Key West, the world's biggest open-air asylum. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and, you know, everybody comes there as a dreamer. But, you know, we actually pulled it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so year later we sailed away and you sailed all over the place and that. so that was the thing i spent 10 years uh sailing up and down the west indies calling coral bay my home base uh-huh. um we did carnival in trinidad like five times we raced in the antigua classic yacht regatta five times yeah the boat won in antigua she won in her class she won line honors once she won the spirit of the regatta award she was famous amazing i would race her with 28 people aboard yeah. we'd roll tack her because i'm an ensign sailor yeah why not right why not roll tack a 63 foot you can take the sailor trailer. out of the dinghy but you can't <laughs> you take know? the dinghy sailor out of the sailor <laughs> it's so true you know <laughs> dean snyder told me if you can drive an ensign you can drive anything yeah because yeah. Well, i called him when i said I'm, I'm going to see you man he said don't worry you can drive anything if you can drive an ensign and turns out he's right. And I basically got an overgrown ensign, tiller driven. Yeah, you know, right. A, I think that about keel. the West Sail every once in a while. Yeah. I'm like, holy smokes. I mean, so we went up and down the West Indies, and it was a charmed life yeah, back yeah. in the day, you know? Still sextant, but basically dead reckoning. Up well, you and can down the see West pretty Indies. much you every can see island, the next, yeah. It's so perfect, man. Not a lot of the fog islands, rolling in there. Yeah, and the <laughs> islands are like 40 miles across. You literally almost have to run into the island to hit anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The reefs are pretty close to shore exactly. and all that sort of stuff. And the islands are 40 miles long, and then there's a 40-mile gap in between them, and then another island. You know, yeah, yeah. It's just so it's beautiful. It's lovely you, sailing. You, you go north chain. on a starboard beat, and you go south on a port beat. It's it's great Just, so 10 years and the fish were plentiful and the reefs were glowing you, you saw it in its heyday the, the there, people pal. were friendly i know i know i mean we we pulled into dominica and this little kid comes running down the dock hey man i take your painter for you hey man hey man oh that's your rubbish head the rubbish is over here you know and what you need what you need oh we were trying to find a chicken and maybe some breadfruit and stuff oh the bread tr- breadfruit tree yeah, yeah the yeah, trees yeah, over yeah, there yeah, Go yeah, get oh, my, yeah. my auntie she got she got chicken for you yeah yeah no, no problem come with me and we wind up having lunch with his family and everything on the on the beach it's still everything. one of the most friendly islands out it there it really really yeah. is i love it i love dominica but seven years later, we came back, and the way the world works, Chiquita Banana had sued the World Trade Organization. Uh, yeah. You know this story. I'm well familiar with it. And so it Yikes. wrecked the economy of Dominica. Uh-huh. And so then they start selling all their foreshore to investors, and it changes the whole vibe. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now there's disparity of wealth. Now there's... There's a lot of corruption. Decline and corruption yeah, and yeah. drugs. And, you know, I helped the boys build these fiberglass speedboats that you don't fishing. bother installing lights on and they hold twin 250s. <laughs> you know? I mean, what do you reckon those boats are for wonder, in Dominica? Yeah, I wonder, right. since their banana crop went away, what's the next biggest cash crop anybody could possibly oh, think of? God. So Yeah, I, I got a good lesson. I have good friends that have you know born there grew up there all that sort of stuff and uh the one nice thing though was that you can if you go to the right places you can still taste what actual real natural bananas are and so many different types red ones and little ones and big ones and they all have seeds and yeah yeah. like i i used to tell people uh, the first time i got back from there and got back to the states i remember seeing you know bananas in the thing just like the ones in the bowl here 
And I'd look at people, I'd be like, you have no idea, but you've been robbed of the actual, a real banana. These that, things taste that like is, chalk that compared to- a banana. That no. is a genetically created- <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's is, a mutant. Yeah, it is. It's a mutant. <laughs> and it's one of the hardest things for me because at this point, I've been on the outside for over 30 years. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. been living in island nations for over 30 years. And the hardest thing for me, having now been back in the U.S. for three years, um, is the food. I mean, right, it's, right. I, I, one of the, I'm, you know, 65 years old and I can jump up and down and climb in the rigging and all that sort of thing. And I really believe that a lot of my health has to do with the fact that I have been eating real food. Yeah. yeah grown yeah. in gardens, actual, actual bananas, actual papaya, actual avocados, actual, you know, the, yeah, the yeah, real yeah. things. Not monocrop grown, like just it's yeah. it's one of the scary subjects to bring up about our changing world. Oh no, for sure, and for that's sure. that's one of the biggest impetuses for me because, as I say, I spent ten years in the Caribbean and then I spent ten years sailing across the Pacific. I was at the Antigua Classic Yacht Regatta, and I had this great three week rum soaked romance with a Kiwi chef on another boat. Mm-hmm. And then she gets back in touch with me when I'm back in Trinidad and says, I'm coming to see you. And I'm like, woohoo. And she said, but I'm not exactly alone. Ooh. <laughs> I had never, Maybe. I had never thought. You got a 50-50 chance there. I had never thought I was going to have kids. Uh, I was 40 at the time. Oh, whoa. Okay. I was That's what I meant by that. Very different. I know. Uh, <laughs> that's what I meant by that. So Congratulations. We decided to give it a go, mm-hmm. and, but we did it with the ex- you know, the the realization that we weren't going to change our lifestyles, yeah. that we were going to continue sailing. And so, okay, let, you're a Kiwi, let's go across the Pacific together. So Layla was born in St. Thomas, and her first birthday was in Costa Rica, and her second birthday was in Tahiti, and her third birthday was in Tonga, and her fourth birthday was in Fiji, and her fifth birthday was in New Zealand. Wow. And that's when mom and I had had enough. Right, right, right. And so I hung out in Fiji. They hung out in New Zealand. I'd spend six months in New Zealand and then six months in Fiji. And Layla would come visit me in Fiji. And so we were kind of, you know, we, we had a really kind of cool thing going. Holy smokes. Wow. And so, so then, um, you know, we had spent five years going across the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. Because I, 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 I'm not one of those sailors that goes and spends two weeks somewhere and then splits. It's yeah, so yeah, yeah. funny. It, you know, if you're there for a week, everybody's friendly. You're a tourist. All of that. You're there for two weeks, somebody might have noticed you. If you're there for three weeks, some local has invited you to dinner. And oh, yeah. if you're there for a month, now you might have had something stolen. And you're <laughs> sort of starting to you're see... You're part the, of the community. You're part of the community. Yeah. You're starting to see both some good of the and dirt bad. underneath, both good yeah, and bad. Yeah. And then if you stay there for four or five months, then you really, you know learn about a place yeah, oh yeah and and so i've been lucky enough to have spent that much time in costa rica and that much time in 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 polynesia and you know french polynesia mm-hmm. and so i got to go with two emotos and hang out with and this kawahi we were in kawahi for five weeks this little atoll yeah. in the two emotos with oh like 60 gosh. people living on it pearl divers yeah we got to know everybody it was just Oh, such a great, you know, a lot of, like you, uh, um, 271 days all that's the way just, around the world. Yeah, but that's that's a, a different I spent realm. 30 I dream. years and only got halfway. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's the thing is, I, I definitely I dream about that that sort of voyage where you're stopping at all these places and you have all the time. Yeah. What What did you do for uh, for like funds to be able to keep things going? Or was it just sort of... Well, there are two things. Hand to mouth. Um, basically, um, we did shared expense cruising. Mm-hmm. We'd get five or six people aboard, oh, say $25 okay. a day. You know, it's like I, I could go into, you know, after, you know, I was single quite a lot doing this thing. Mm-hmm. And so I'd go to a backpackers and just hang out and have dinner and say, hey, uh, you want to go sailing across the Pacific with me? Um, it's 30 bucks a day. A day, and you're paying thirty bucks a night at the backpacker. So, oh nice! You know, and wow. I'd okay. put together yeah. a completely inexperienced crews of five or six people, and go sailing. And that's one of the re- things that has gotten me into the position that I am today, because um, you take your typical first worlder, 
and put them on a boat for a few months and sail them around to places where the rest of the world lives, mm-hmm. which are poor people, Yeah, yeah. basically. Um, Very different. It's a game changer. It's a life changer. People come back and they, they realize that, you know, what they have going on around them might not actually be where their heart lies. Because one of the things that uh, you learn when you go hang out in those communities, um, there's a chapter in my book called Why Are They So Happy? I yeah, was, yeah, I was yeah. doing day sales in Vanuatu. And in Vanuatu, it's like the last place on earth, man. And, and the, the, the market has got a dirt floor. And, the you know, the people live in grass houses mm-hmm. uh, and tin shacks and all this sort of thing. And all the tourists would come and they'd go out on my boat and do a pirate day sail. And the question always came up. Because when you walk down the streets of Port Villa and Vanuatu, you hear laughter. Yeah, yeah. You watch men holding hands as they walk down the street because they're friends. Right. You see the family unit get together and eat. You never see anyone eat by themselves in Vanuatu. They always have a community kai kai. Yeah. Kai kai is food eating. And uh, and so there's all these uh, things that you learn um, about why are they so happy? Because they have a sense of community. Because, you know, if auntie's sick, they just don't go to work. So as a Westerner, and I used to manage resorts there, it's really frustrating because half your staff doesn't show up every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's because they have different priorities. Exactly. They, they don't care about the money. Your, your values of, of all the things in your life are very, very vastly different that's right. in places like that. And I've only, I've only touched on that because most of the Caribbean islands that I've frequented are kind of the first world Caribbean islands. Like the British Virgin Islands, it steps back in time from like the USVI, but still. No, that's pretty first world yeah, still. You know, yeah. They have real life grocery stores and all that kind of but stuff. But at the same time, I mean, I, I was very fortunate to get ingratiated into the community after a number of years and like, you know, birthday parties, funerals, family, all that sort of stuff. I was always there. And yeah, I mean, I, we got the same same sort of question from from the guests that would come to the resort they're like man everybody's just really happy yeah yeah. and it's it's like well they don't they don't live in big houses most people don't even have cars yeah yeah. but those are the things that we value but in in reality if you're looking for a true smile and a true definition of happiness that's not that's not yeah. what provides it. Yeah, it's true. Vanuatu even won about five or six years ago the happiest place on the planet. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how they judge it all, but anyway. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, that's one of the lessons that my crew would learn. The people that I would take out, the hundreds of people in my 30 years of doing that kind of shared expense cruising and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, they would learn those lessons and literally come back and change their lives. And so a lot of people have a lot of passion around my old boat because it was such a powerful influence right, on right, their right. life. I mean, that's life changing. Yeah, that sort it is. of experience. It is. Yeah. It is. And and as I was traveling, I, you know, that's the one way that I funded myself. But I was also very lucky in that my hands can do things. I'm a carpenter. Right, I'm a right. bit of a mechanic. I'm a bit, which also makes it handy when you're a boater. Because you have to be other able to boaters do always got problems. And they yeah. don't always have solutions, exactly. or sometimes That's... they just want to trade a little cash for a there convenience. You go. So yeah. yeah, but I was always, you know, pretty much on the bones of my ass. You know, I, was, I never had any money, never had any security, and was uninsured the whole time. And all of that, I was. So am I. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's hard to find insurance for uh, uh, solo uh, nonstop. No. Well, I, <laughs> I unbelievably managed to find liability for an over fifty foot wooden boat, which is nigh on impossible yeah, in today's not world. Bad, right? But yeah, so um, so anyway, um, there I am. Um, now we've uh, uh, I'm you know uh, I'm in, hanging in Fiji. And my daughter's in, in New Zealand, and then they moved to Australia, and I wind up in, and I, so I moved to Vanuatu. No way. And so way. now I spend, wow. I spend 10 years in Vanuatu. I'm actually a citizen of Vanuatu. I have dual citizenship. Very cool. And uh, Were you and, able to haul the boat out there? No. They don't have anything. They don't have yeah, it. Yeah, well, yeah. I actually did wind up hauling the boat out. Yeah, later, later on, they have a railway up in Santo. Uh, oh, run okay. by the Seven Day Adventist School. Really? And uh, yeah, so I did wind up hauling her out there eventually. 
Gotcha. But it was, yeah, I went too long and she was starting to get in, in crummy shape. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so I literally was, uh, I, I was about, I put her on the market cause I, I couldn't make enough money in Vanuatu to keep her up. I, yeah. She was not in good enough condition to go anywhere else. And so I was like, holy smokes, you know, so I kind of put her on the market. I went to visit a bunch of my friends in New Zealand because I had spent a summer in the viaduct in Auckland with her. And when I sailed her down there from Fiji, uh, she won the Russell Tall Ships Regatta in New Zealand. Not she bad. was an amazing vessel, amazing yeah, yeah, yeah. vessel. And so I had tons of friends in New Zealand. So I went, went to visit them, and, uh, and they came up with a plan for me to, uh, to raise some money to save the boat. And they said, Harold, you've got to write your book. Yep. And so the plan was, was that I would get 200 people to invest $200, and they would all, as a group, be a 50% partner in the book that I was to write. And I was going to write it in a year, and that was the thing. If you guys finance me to write the book and save the boat, then we'll keep the boat, and I'll write the book, and you guys are all a partner in the book. Oh, wow. Interesting. That's one way to do it. Yeah. And unbelievably it words I'm there, appeared I'm on there the page. in New Zealand <laughs> and and in in 10 days I had raised uh, like $13,000 from all of these people yeah, who yeah, had yeah. been passionate about the boat you know they're like you know and then 5 days before I was to go back to Vanuatu with my Dream come true. Yeah. The the um the, the you know the uh, thing working. A chance to write the book. A chance to fix the boat. I get a call from my buddy who'd been looking after the boat. And um. Uh-oh. I hear it in so, your voice already. Yeah. And uh and he said, Harold, you need to get back here sooner than later. <laughs> Should we pause to get her? <clears throat> Uh, I don't, I don't think okay. the Maybe the noise isn't in, coming. Yeah, We've I mean, got Christmas lights being cleaned up yeah, off the deck. I don't want to so. hinder any work, you know, work yeah. aboard. This okay. is a working ship here. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, if, if there's a background noise, that's what's going yeah, on. We're cleaning yeah. up from the Christmas parade. <laughs> but, no um, back to the story. So Ben says, Harold, you got to get back here sooner than later. I don't know what happened, but she's waist deep and she's been trashed. Jeez. And... You know, I spent 30 years, I call it watching the switch flip. You get somewhere, like we were talking about Dominica. Yeah. You know, seven years later, I went back to Dominica. Little boy comes running down the dock. I'm like, you know, ready to hand him his painter. He folds his arm like this. He says, hey, white man, give me a dollar. <laughs> I'm like, why do, I need, why do I need to give you a dollar? <laughs> he said, I watch your dinghy, man. Bad things happen to dinghies here. Oh, geez. And I'm like, oh, come on, man, really? You know? And then we go walk up the river and... and Big dude jumps out in front of us. Hey, man, $15, you walk up this river. It's just the way. Yeah. And yeah. and I have watched white people show up on islands and watch the switch flip. It takes about six, seven, eight years, ten years. They come in, they buy all the foreshore. They start putting barbed wire fences down to the beach so that the locals can't walk the beach anymore because now there's private property. Yeah. The disparity of wealth becomes apparent because they're building $250,000, half a million dollar um you know, vacation homes in the beautiful islands and the locals get displaced from their thing and then the disparity of wealth starts creating the crime and then, you know, the the the, the it's, in the beginning they steal your flippers and your snorkels and your towels and things they can use and, and then eventually they somebody becomes a fence and then they start stealing your televisions and your, you know, GPSs and your everything else's mm-hmm. and, and it's just a it's an endemic Thing that I've watched, yeah, yeah, and so I was one of the first victims in Vanuatu. When I got to Vanuatu, you could leave your flip flops and go for a swim and come back. And ten right, years right. later, your flip flops are you Still kidding? There, yeah, they're right. they're gone the minute you turn your back. Yes. Um, and and the whole crime thing had gotten really bad, and people's houses were getting burglarized, and so the 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 you know white folk were putting glass top walls well, around yeah, their houses I've seen those and, in South Africa. you know yeah yeah you <laughs> yeah. know it's 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 a, a, a cultural issue that has gone on forever 
And I thought I'd found the last place on earth, on earth, Vanuatu. Yeah, right. And um, and so no, I was one of the first victims. The boys had gotten on board and stolen everything. Every they stole my stove. Yeah. They stole all the cushions. Oh, they stole geez. everything. And when well, they, and on an island like that too, it's not like you can really hide the fact that you did it. I know. Everybody knows who did it. it that was the most painful part for me when I got Look at back. all those nice cushions sitting on that porch. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, it's like that was that part was a big part. But the main thing was, was that, you know, when they chopped away the electronics, it shorted out the batteries, and her bilge pump quit working, and she was having trouble with yeah, worms. Yeah. So she had a leak. And so when my buddy, who had been walk, going and checking her every week, had gone away for two weeks, when he got back... She was waist deep, Ugh, waist deep. That's hard to say. Well, imagine. Yeah. So it was a full wipe. Yeah. I spent two years trying to recover, and eventually my friends convinced me I had an unreasonable emotional attachment. Right. Her. It's kind of yeah. Like, you got to let her go, Harold. You just got to let her go. Do what Montesia did with Joshua. Go. Just now. Meanwhile, let it go. I did it. I fulfilled my promise. In one year, I sent the book off to be edited. Oh, nice. I had completed the manuscript. I sent it off to be edited. In the next eight months, I wound up self-publishing. And so I fulfilled the dream of getting the book out there. Now, I hadn't <laughs> hadn't made any money. I mean, books don't... It's hard. It's, not, it's pretty so, difficult. So yeah, all yeah, of my yeah. partners that, you know, all of my, my you know, players... They're pleasures, like, this is going to be our them. cash cow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nah, hey. it's, yeah, books aren't really... Uh, the way to get rich are they uh no i mean they can be if you were sitting you know across from joe rogan he probably would get quite a uh, yeah, quite a yeah. boost in probably, sales probably but. right well i might and unfortunately <laughs> i'm actually out of print in my paperback because i need to do another print run and i'm too busy focused on this project well i'll i, I think after after we get off the show i i can talk to you about that uh, at least a different avenue you can go down but yeah yeah okay we'll anyway we'll talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the authoring that must have been the worst so aspect. so what was the outcome? So the outcome was the that I uh, I wound up having to scuttle the boat. Ay, ay, ay. That's, I mean. Yeah. But if it's completely gutted. 30 years. Uh, I, you know, I, I tried hard. Put a new engine in her. I tried so hard to come back. And like I said, all my friends just said, Harold, come on, man. You're killing yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and meanwhile, I'm trying to write the book. And, I, you know, and so eventually... I had the book out. It was published. I scuttled the boat and and then went to, back to the States to do a book tour. And uh, that's when all my friends got together and said, Harold, uh, we, we can't have this. Uh, we've all been living vicariously through you. And, you know, we, we what are we going to do? Yeah, yeah, right. And I said, well, you know, you remember when we raced in Antigua? And I used to talk about this idea of building six of them just like her because she's so famous and so fast and so amazing. We could build a one design fleet and then we could go around to all the regattas and we could collect data about the ocean and we could do presentations about the environment and stuff like that. Because by then, I'd been 30 years at sea. Yeah. And now... Got a little knowledge under your belt. Well, and I'm also um, very impassioned about what is going on on our planet. Yeah. I mean, if you're a sailor, I'm sorry, there's no arguing about climate change. I mean, I started screaming about climate change 15 years ago, before Al Gore, because it's extraordinarily apparent if you live at sea how quickly the sea is changing. And in fact, you know, I mean, okay, we're going to go ahead and do the reality check. And, and I know that we try and stay positive about everything. But Mother Ocean is dying at a rate that is just phenomenal. If you live on her and you look below the surface and you watch the reefs dying yeah. and you see the depletion of the fish and you see the garbage, it's overwhelming. It's, it's staggering. You put your real live eyes on it. You don't need scientists telling you data about why the planet is changing or what is going on. Your eyes, I have a personal data set about yeah. what is going on that has driven me to where I am right now. It's a big part of the message in my book. So, you know, that was six or seven years ago when I wrote my book and I was saying, guys, it's time to wake up. It's time to get together as one world, one planet. Let's, let's come on. Let's get this together. I've traveled all over everywhere and I've noticed one thing about humanity. 
we're all the same. We all love to love. We all love to have a great meal and a sense of community. And we all love. We're all the same. So let's get together and save our ocean. Save our planet. Have a planet left for our our sons and daughters. I'm so scared for Layla. There's, there's, oh, I couldn't even imagine. Yeah, You yeah. know, it, it's just like unbelievable. So the concept was developed. The Cassiopeia Schooner Project. Yeah, let's build six boats. But let's not just go race them around in regattas. Let's have one boat with doctors and one boat with marine biologists and one boat with circus people and, and one boat with builders. And let's go to coastal communities <laughs> That's awesome. and, and create <laughs> well-being. Yeah. Let's go have a multilateral approach to somewhere. Let's go sit somewhere for a month with eyes on us, a million viewers, as this fleet of schooners sails all around and we and we we plant coral and we build a health clinic and we bring some doctors who do cataract surgeries or some optometrists that do cataract surgeries and we and then we plant some permaculture gardens so that they can have resilience from the storms we go around and we tie the rafters down yeah, yeah we get all the chiefs on board and we have 25 orange buoys on the back of the boat and we say all right guys this isn't some government decree that there's going to be a conservation zone or whatever. This is you going sailing with me, and we're going to go decide where we're going to put these buoys, and nobody's going to fish there for a while. And we're going to create a hope zone in your community yeah. so that we can start getting your fish back. And so I have this, we've come up with this concept of building a fleet of boats to then go use them as a powerful way of having boots on the ground to do things. If each boat has eight people on it and we show up in a community and we are funded by all of our followers and all of our viewers and we are able to get ideas and ways of helping these coastal communities um, even in refurbishing their boat building traditions Yeah, because yeah. we're going to build wooden boats and they all know how to build wooden boats. So we could build fleets literally all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so my gang all got together and crowdfunded me to go to Thailand to find a boat yard where we could build this fleet of wooden boats. So I went and spent four months in Thailand, in Phuket. Oh, wow. Found a boat yard. Yeah. Did a whole spreadsheet on the whole thing, you know, and what our intentions are, our mission statement, and then the spreadsheet that went down to every single board, nut, screw, bolt, uh, immigration costs, shipping costs, because I'm going to get all the timber from Louisiana. We're going to build them out of uh, a renewable resource, pine. Yeah, yeah. The old boat was all built out of pine. And um, and it was a very unusual construction technique. It was laid on a ferro-cement keel. Really? So the oh, keel okay. came up. And flared out about a foot and a half. Uh -huh. And then there was a rabbit in it for the garboard, the bottom plank. Yeah. And then it turned and came back across and made the top of the keel. And they left stainless bolts sticking up. And then they steamed one by fours through as the frames. Oh, okay. And then they carvel planked it. And the cement comes up and makes the stem of the boat. And then oh, the really? planks just go to the outside edge of the concrete flange that's up there on the front. Yeah, in and, case the, and the cement comes up into the aft cabin and makes the horn timber, which the rudder post goes through. Oh, so okay. all the hard part of building a wooden boat yeah. is done out it's of the done cement. Out of cement. Yeah. And it means that the turn of the bilge was as sharp as my fist because the cement just came straight up and then did like that. And I think that's one of the reasons that she was so fast. Because uh, all the rest of her kindred have to bend the frames and do the floors yeah, and the turn of the yeah, bilge yeah. is all hard. And building the keel is all hard. Huge timbers locked together and everything. Right, right. And, um, and, and the stem and all of that's the hard part of building a wooden boat. And you've done all that in two weeks by yeah. just bending the rebar, uh, putting some chicken wire on it, troweling the <laughs> yeah, yeah. over there, and then filling it up. Right. And so it... You know, all the boat builders looked at this concept and went, sure, man. And in fact, the original boat was built by Rob DeMatteo when he was 27 years old when his, with his dad and one other helper. And they did it in one year in a barn in North Carolina. Really? Yeah. That's a fast build time for Fast build that big time a for a 63-foot overall, you know, gaff rig wooden schooner. But it really is. It's just such a simple building technique. 
so the idea is we're going to build all six at once mm -hmm. and you know, put them in a building. And so, like I said, I went to Thailand and I talked to all the builders and came up with this spreadsheet. And it's a million and a half bucks. To, per boat or all no, boats? all six of them. That's not out. that bad. That's dinghies. That's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, For yeah. a million and a half bucks. Now, this was two and a half years ago, so... We got a, a little inflation, yeah, a yeah. little inflation, little. and this and that and the other. <laughs> and then I reckon it's going to cost a million bucks to operate them for the first year mm -hmm. with paid skippers and maintenance and some, you know, to admin and yeah. all that sort of stuff. So we have created the Cassiopeia Schooner Project, which is now a 501c3, and we are going to try and raise two and a half million dollars uh, to build a fleet of boats. And um, and now we have the mothership. Right here. So I'm back in the Virgin Islands promoting this project. Yeah. And uh, and the story thickens. My friend Alexis, um, who has done an incredible documentary called Vanishing Sail. And it is about the boat building tradition in Kariaku, which is an island just north of Grenada. Yeah. Back in the good old West Indies. Now, all the boys in Kariaku remember my old boat. Because I used to sail up and down the West Indies for 10 years, you know. And they all remember. I actually kind of won the i entered the karaoke wooden boat regatta once and mm -hmm. and won but I, I i wasn't an official winner because i wasn't officially in the race yeah because i wasn't one of their boats because it's all about their boats right, right and right. so you know yeah and um but it but, uh, but i outran them right. i outran them and they all they all loved it you know they, they, they're like <laughs> well man, well cool boat strong boat man strong boat. yeah right and so um so alexis invited me heard about my project and invited me to Antigua to sail with him in his wooden boat that was built in Kariuku called Genesis. They build these 44-foot wooden sloops that are all kind of race boats. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they were they were built for island trading. Yeah, quickly. yeah, yeah. And, but, they don't um, have the planks coming out. Uh, no, a, no. Those, yeah, they're, that's they're not not know. those ones. Those are like um, Bahamian, aren't those they? Those are Bahamian, yeah, yeah, yeah the ones with the planks. Okay. Yeah, but they're similar, you know. Right, they're right, kind right. of a, a big gas sail, get sloop, there quick, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And uh, so I went down to Kariaku with Alexis on Genesis, and we actually, first time Genesis had ever won, we won the regatta. Um, that was sort of cool because I was on board. Nice. And so then when I stuck around for the next few weeks and went to talk to all the boat builders there and the community there about my idea of building this fleet mm -hmm. in Kariaku. And they're all like, oh, please, yes, 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 help us revive our wooden boat building tradition. Here's a 70-year-old woman that runs the, uh, runs the Maritime Museum there in Kariaku. And, uh, and she literally hugged me and, and had tears in her eyes, saying, please, we're losing our children. They're all on their cell phones. Yeah. I, I get choked up even just talking about it. You might be able to hear that in my yeah, voice. Well, that, because yeah. it's so true. I mean, that whole community is like, gosh, we're just, I mean, this is what we are. We're seafarers. We're wooden boat builders. We're like, There's a you know, rich history there's there. There's a rich history there. And that's what Alexis was trying to put together show in his documentary vanishing sales so mm -hmm. go check it out anybody who, yeah you know, I'll definitely have it's to. really really cool and so i met all the guys all the characters that you'll see in that film i now know oh nice and 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 so now the goal is is that uh so i left the regatta went back to the virgin islands covid hit and i'm sitting there um kind of promoting the project. Okay, yeah. we've got this two and a half million dollar deal. Let's go build boats and carry a coup. Let's help their economy. And then we can use the boats all along the Venezuela coast to do incredible things with the Amazon, you know, with everything that's going on with the deforestation there. And we can use them all there in the Caribbean to deal with lionfish and to deal with reef degeneration. And we can, you know, oh, I got all these yeah, great, right. you know, ideas. Super positive. Here visions. we go. Yeah, here we go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And that's when I get the call from the shipwright in Savannah saying, hey, how about a mothership for your project? And then my friends lend me the money to get the mothership. And now, three years later, the mothership is ready to go. Yeah. So our project, the, the, this boat is going to spearhead the project. The goal right now is to get this boat back to Antigua by April. Yeah. So I'm going to do some proof of concept uh, by doing some aid runs over to the Bahamas. I'm already hooked up with uh, Danny, who has got a great organization called the Hope Fleet 
If any of you yachties out there on the east coast of the U.S. are, are listening, uh, just Google up the Hope Fleet. Okay. He's putting together all kinds of ways of helping out in the DR, in the Bahamas, and even in Cuba. Oh, wow. And okay. one of the ways that he's helping out is he's put together these buckets, these five-gallon buckets that are called Hope Buckets. And they're full of dirt and seeds and a rain-catching device and everything you need to apparently grow enough food to feed a family of four for a year. Really? Yeah. Wow. And so he's he's already delivered hundreds and hundreds of them to the Bahamas. Yeah. And he's looking for other yachts. So his his project, you sign up with his project, and then if you're going somewhere, oh, you he will some, deliver yeah. stuff all up and down the southern east coast to your boat so that you can drop it off in the DR or in the Bahamas or whatever. And he's doing school supplies and and it's just a, a wonderful, oh, wow. wonderful yeah, yeah, yeah. faith-based good. charity mission thing that is, you know. And so I've kind of hooked up with him. Yeah. He literally was planning on bringing me a van full of stuff because we were going to try and do our first run last weekend. Uh-huh. But the weather's The weather turned, bad. Yeah, and, yeah. And it was also a bit of a push because, again, I'm still in sea trial mode I was going to say, girl. yeah. But, you know, you know, just, luckily, the Bahamas are right there. Yeah, still, luckily, they're still. right there, but still. Still, I mean, you go out in the ocean, you go out in the ocean. I don't know what these people talk about, coastal sailors. Yeah, right. right. If you can't swim ashore. I, <laughs> you're in the ocean. You're, you're, your boat better be good enough to be in the ocean, you know? I mean, that's, I don't, I don't get this, like, double standard of, oh, I'm, I'm just I'm just a coastal sailor. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, i've been sea. in some pretty serious yeah, quarrels right. along the coastlines well, that's that that is i mean that's an ambitious ambitious plan it's 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 like inspired i i love the idea and i mean obviously well what obviously the number one problem is trying to get the funds to raise the okay. funds so okay. how 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 essentially can people get involved with it well, I'm monetarily know, at at the moment. We do have a GoFundMe, and okay. we also, you know, have Zelle and all those other ways of of accepting donations. And again, we are a registered five hundred one c three nonprofit called the Cassiopeia Schooner Project. Uh-huh. So it can be looked up, and so any donations are tax write off. Yeah, and um, and but you know, kind of uh, what I'm hoping to do is uh, is get the project on its feet with maybe a or two or three benefactors really i mean like you know there's another story in the book called a poor man's millionaire when i was <laughs> racing in antigua you know i had like 50 bucks in my pocket and we were pulled in in between alejandra and shamrock nice and they're serving caviar and 600 hundred dollar bottles of champagne and we've got our ice chest full of budweiser yeah. and our spaghetti bolognese on our plastic dining room table on the <laughs> four deck and you know probably having a better time i'm the poor man's millionaire <laughs> you know and literally i'm sitting there talking to dennis connor and and uh, you know at the thing and i'm like hey you guys are gonna come down to trinidad and I, oh no i gotta go here and i gotta go there and i gotta do this and i and i realized that you know my I was actually, in a way, richer than them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're I didn't free. have any money, but I was free. Right. And here I was, sitting in Antigua, on my four deck, having a great meal with great friends. Um, and I could actually spill wine on my deck without it mattering. Yeah, I know, right? You know, that, that, you can't do that on, <laughs> on, on unless you own it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that i can bang into someone yeah yeah. there are lots of people out there in the yachting world um and lots of organizations involved in the yachting world and foundations and things like that where that kind of money isn't really that much oh yeah no for sure to be quite honest Uh i mean there are lots of you know 50 million dollar boats out there there's there's they, they, lots of like they, 200 million dollars yeah, there's a lot Jeez. of boats that, that their operating cost is 50 million dollars mm-hmm. yeah. and so if you know i mean the the incredible efficiency of of, the, of this build and the possibilities of what it could do for the economy of Kariaku. let's just start with Kariaku yeah, as yeah, our yeah. thing the economy of Kariaku could really really change and when we're done, we're going to build a building 
that all six boats can fit in to be built. Mm -hmm. Right. Just kind of a, you know, a, each one will have a little roof over it and all that. And it'll all be tied together. And when we leave, all that infrastructure will still be there. Yeah. They yeah. can carry on carry building on, these boats. Yeah, exactly. They can carry on building, you know, more boats. And then that fleet can operate in their waters, helping their environment. That's why they're so excited about it, because they, too, are not just excited about building boats and creating economy. They are concerned because they're the sargasso weed issue and the oh, yeah. lionfish issue and their reefs and their fisheries and the depletion of everything and the storms. They're all very aware that, you know, it's not going in the right direction, it's not going in the right direction. And to so put it nicely, one of the beautiful things about this concept is that everyone responds very differently to a big wooden schooner than they do to your typical vessel. I've been so uh, yeah, blessed. Yeah, I mean, you heard me when we pulled up here, right? Yeah. Holy, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, throughout my entire sailing career, I got so lucky because I would pull into a port and in moments, some fisherman in a wooden boat, a wooden dinghy would row up and bang on the hull and go, Amon, strong boat. Yeah. My yeah. granddaddy built boat like this. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I'm like, come <laughs> aboard, man. Come aboard. And so everywhere I went, I met the local fishermen. I met the local community because the boat has a different image. Yeah, yeah. And then just the beauty of them when they're underway, like all the main schooners. Everybody's always posting pictures of they're the main gorgeous. schooners because they're gorgeous. That gaff so just rig and visualize uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. six gaff rig schooners tacking their way into a harbor to drop their anchors. Everyone in the community knowing. <laughs> I'm getting choked up again because yeah, yeah, I yeah. believe in this I so know, much. I know, yeah. Um, everybody in the community knowing that we're there to to help, but not in the way that I have seen help be organized in all of my years because that's the other thing. You know, I've been on the outside. I've watched. Now, I'm, I, again, all of these uh, organizations that are trying to do cool stuff all around the world, I s totally support them. I'm totally into UNICEF, yeah. Red Cross, all of that kind of stuff. Every all of all of that. However, if you've been out there and you've watched what really happens on the ground and you've seen how cumbersome the system is for them to operate within with their donors and with their top heavy organizations and administration costs and all of that sort of stuff. It mm. You know, anyone who's really been on the ground watching it knows that there are a lot of difficulties in pulling that off and actually getting results yeah. on the ground. And so I'm very sure that our approach, most of the people who are going to be involved in my project are expats, people who have lived on the outside. Mm. Uh, you know, multinationals. One of the most amazing things that's happened to me during putting all this together is we have a Facebook group. And our Facebook group, I believe, represents at least 65 or 70 countries. Oh, wow. I nice. have people who have joined in watching my little live Facebook thing and said, Harold, we love your passion. We love your idea. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. And so I have uh, members from Kiev. I have a wooden boat builder from Kiev. Oh, really? Who, nice. <laughs> when I was getting depressed in the boatyard, he, he had his little wooden boat and his son was a racer, you know, before. Yeah. And so he was, it was before. And then what happened over there happened. Yeah. And so then, you know, I'm in the boatyard, you know, and I'm, I do a show where I'm a little bit grumpy and all this sort of stuff. And, and good old Ivan sends, yeah, me, he's right. he hey, sends me a picture of a <laughs> missile going by out of his window, you know, and landing on his buddy's house. Cheer up. And it's like, <laughs> easy, brother. Um, and it is true. One of the yeah. biggest lessons of my life is that, uh, good grief, man, uh, live in a state of gratitude. Totally. If, if you're in this kind of position, you know, I mean, I start with first worlders and I say, you know, Let's just start with your refrigerator. You, you know, you think you got it rough. You think things are going bad for you and all that sort of stuff. But guess what? You have a refrigerator. Yep. More than half of the people that I've known in my last 30 years couldn't even consider a refrigerator. 
there is not enough electricity in their village or their town yeah. or anything to even run a refrigerator, much less privately own a refrigerator. And you've got a freezer in your garage and a bar fridge under next to your pool, and you've got to, and you're being all grumpy about things. So there is perspective is a is an important part to keep oh, in it's mind huge. and you know. not taking it for granted. I mean, and and not even just in like the things that you have, but the the availability. You know, I I can remember going to the dentist this this summer, and I had to have a lot of work done, very expensive, yeah. and I should have been kind of like, dang it, man, blah blah, blah yeah, and I don't want to go, and blah, blah blah. All I could think to myself is, and this is only from being out on the ocean where. You, there are no dentists but yeah. yourself. And I'm thinking to myself, God, we are so lucky to be able to go into a place yeah. where a professional can actually fix your teeth and take your pain away. Yeah, yeah. It's and all so you got to do is give them money. But still, it's like uh, most people would be like, I hate the dentist. I don't ever want to go. I'm thinking to myself, God, I'm so lucky this didn't happen to me out at sea. Yeah, you know, yeah absolutely right. It, get the vice grips. It's one of the, one of the things I've always done on my little you know, uh, presentation is that I compare the lessons of Mother Ocean to, uh, to, to life. Um, like when I was a racing sailor, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you, we call it hero to zero, you know? So if, you, <laughs> if you've nailed the start and you're at the windward mark and you're in first place, I would pause for a minute and, and revel yeah. and say, this is cool. Because on the downwind leg, you might get your chute tangled up, and five boats are going to pass you, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then you, and then you have to do this recovery thing, and say, "Oh, now we're in last. Oh man, oh man, I'm so depressed." And you could just dwell on it, but no, you got to let go of that and say, "We're going to catch that boat, and then we're going to catch <laughs> that boat, and then we're going to catch that boat." Plot and, and plan. And so there's so many um, lessons that mother ocean can teach you and I, there's another analogy i do about what's going on in our our world today um when you're a sailor and something starts to go wrong like let's say uh you're you're on a beat in a pretty good sea and your jib sheet uh breaks mm -hmm. and now your jib's up there flogging all around okay and yeah. you're looking out through the pilot house windows and you're going oh man oh man good but the grommet on that thing could kill you because it's blowing like mad, and, and you, you, you really don't know how you're going to get to the front end of the sail to get it down because this thing's going to try and kill you. Yeah. But you know what you do? You start putting on your foul weather gear. You don't really have a plan. You don't know how you're going to fix it. You don't, but you, you don't have start any trying. You have to you have fix to it go, because yeah. you know everything is exponential. If the thing keeps flogging until it breaks the force day, and then the rig comes down and it pokes a hole in your boat, you know you have to act. You have to act. My my daddy was from Texas, and he used to say, boy, <laughs> do something, even if it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, And it's yeah. so true. And so sailing teaches you that you're sitting there in the pilot house, and you don't know how you're going to do it, but you're putting on your foul weather gear, and then you slither along the deck, crawling, you know. Um, hands and knees is always good on a boat. Uh, yeah, in 50 knots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. have to. So you're slithering your way up there, and you realize that if you just get really, really low and squirm on your belly underneath the jib, then the grommet of the sail can't get to you. Oh, and you can God. get to the front end of the sail to pull it down. Yeah. And so then you start pulling it down, you know. And, um, and that's the thing. It seems like in our world right now, all of our leaders are standing there in the pilot house watching the jib flog and... Arguing and scare, about what arguing the hell, about what to do, what's you know. The best way to Nobody's it. pulling on their foul weather gear. Even they're yeah. just sitting there going, "Well, what are we going to do? I can't see what to do. Can you see what to do? No, I can't see what to do. Okay, well, let's do nothing." Well, I know why that parted, and it's that person's yeah. fault. And it's probably <laughs> yeah, you didn't tie the knot right, and so let's get busy blaming each other on why the jib is flogging instead of Meanwhile, getting out there and we're getting sinking. the jib down. Yeah, Meanwhile, yeah. our planet is. No, I know, I know, I know. You're yeah. very passionate about it. I can see that. That's I am. Sure. Well, like I say, I was so blessed. 30 years of living on Mother Ocean. And, um, I mean, the, 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 you know, I participated. When yeah, I first yeah. started, uh, down in Trinidad, they've got these big, uh, big, um, um, oh, what a big round flatfish. Um, sunfish? Uh, yeah, sunfish. Yeah. And um, they got these black ones. And there, there was thousands of them so you could get in with your spear gun and just go bing 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 
Yeah, yeah. I've fished reefs that have never been spearfished. Oh, wow. And in the old days, like and when I first started, you could tell the difference between a reef that had never been spearfished and a reef that had had two spear fishermen on it, whatever. They fish There's learn. an awareness. Yeah, fish, would, yeah. fish would just swim up to you and go, hey, how you doing today? Well, I'm okay, but you're about to not be. Yeah. I'm about to shoot you in the face. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so at this point, I'm definitely uh, very passionate about uh, using this vessel, this platform, and the fleet as a way of influencing people about the fact that we can, we have time, we can change it. We can. It's our personal habits that are the main way we can affect things. You know, we can affect what's going on in the fishing industry, what's going on in the deforestation situation with our consumer power. And that's what all of my heroes say uh, David Attenborough, Sylvia Earle, Paul Watson. You know, interestingly, I'm just going to go ahead and bring up this point because they all promote it. They are all vegan. Mm. They all stay. I didn't know Attenborough was, huh? Interesting. Yeah. The most powerful thing you can do personally to affect the health of our planet is to change your diet. Because uh, industrial, you know, uh, feedlots and all that sort of thing are what, you know, destroy the rainforest. Um, the industrial fishing has depleted our fish stocks by 90% in the last 70 years. Imagine the entire ocean, 90% of the life has been drug out of it by us in the past 70 years. Yeah. That's that a one, shocking statistic. It's, it's pretty crazy, right? But that's yeah. true. I mean, I it's real. It's, and so, the, so I'm really hoping that by... Using this vessel and my fleet, two things can be exhibited. One is hope and, and compassion. And, and the fact that we can take our world and share it with the other world. We can learn how to be happy. We can learn about the medicines that they use. Coexisting. We, we, can, we can share. We can become a human family using vessels to help promote the fact that you know, we are all the same and we can work together in, in very powerful ways. And I believe that we have just as much to learn from the outside as what we can give to the outside with our dental technologies and with our <laughs> yeah. health yeah, technologies right. and things like that, you know. I mean, in Vanuatu, when you get a toothache, you tie a bandana around your mouth so the air doesn't hurt your tooth. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, I just think of Castaway and Tom Hanks popping it out with a, uh, <laughs> yeah, with a, the blade off of an ice skate. But mm -hmm. uh, well, your your passion is definitely uh, infectious, and it's uh, I don't know. I I I'm thinking to myself how I can somehow get involved in this and well be I, able to sort of help. I mean, I'm not a rich man, so obviously I couldn't uh, contribute that way. But I, mean, I do have a boat, and I mean, I I see it. I've seen the change in our ocean as far as, you know, the deep blue sea, the plastic and all that over just the last 22 years. The first first time I went across or first time I went offshore was 2001. And since then, I've seen a huge increase in the amount of stuff that's floating around out there. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, apparently, um, like you m mentioned sailing through the garbage patch in the Atlantic, yeah, South Atlantic know? one. Yeah. yeah, and the North Pacific. Apparently, it's it's Way really worse, hard to yeah. motor uh, if you need to because you're constantly sucking stuff up on your on your intake. Well, there's a lot of fishing stuff and, floating around, nets yeah. getting caught on everything. And again, that's one of the biggest parts of the plastic problem has to do with again our industrial fishing yeah, industry. Yeah, so yeah. if we keep supporting that industry, including with subsidies, our government subsidize and have for a long time the cattle industry, and they we are literally paying taxes to industries like the oil industry that make incredible profits and yet our governments are subsidizing these things so they can continue it's oh it's a, very a little messed odd, up it's yeah a little it's a little messed, messed up, up man it's, it's I, I don't think anybody would deny that uh things are a little bit askew you know like i said i mean we don't get into politics on here That's too right. much but like it is one of those things where i think everybody's kind of waking up to the realization that there's 
there's a bit of a rigged game going on. Yeah, and and, and it is. It's a crazy old world now. And yeah. again, it's hard. Like like literally when I first started my little um, uh, uh, Facebook Live, it mm-hmm. was because COVID had hit. And so I had I had helped build a uh, thing or helped work with a, a group called Kids in the Sea in St. John when I was there 30 some odd years ago. Kids in the Sea. Kids in the Sea. You I've, may have known it. Uh yeah, one of the IC 24s was sponsored <laughs> by Kids in the Sea that we used to rent for the pro am at Bitter End. Well, guess what? When I got back uh, from racing with Alexis uh-huh. and was hanging out on the Virgin Islands, uh, those two IC 24s were um, kind of dead. And so the Cats gangs, and I had yeah, been an cats, instructor. Cats, yeah, yeah. I had been an instructor. There were two of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them, uh, one, uh, yeah. They well, both got bought up and taken over to Nanny Key. Yeah. And they had a fleet of maybe six or ten. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pre cool. Irma, but. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I um, I I po- I was post Irma. Oh, okay, okay. And the boats had gone into dis- disrepair. Yeah, yeah. And so I got there and refurbished them. And so then COVID hit. And so cats quit. You know, and right, so right. one of them was sitting next to this little 28 footer that I was living on. That was a friend of mine's that had been dismasted in Irma. And uh, and so I was just living on it as a place to live in Johnson's Bay and Coral Bay. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the little IC 24 was sitting there. And so I started going out on it and uh, and just filming it. And single-handing yeah, yeah, yeah. her and putting the shoot up and getting the shoot all wrapped around the forest day and you know being a you know, goofball having and, fun and yeah. I was blowing my corn corn and, and taking a swig <laughs> of tequila and, and raising my peace flag and, yeah, and so I started right. doing this little forty-minute take everybody out for a sail to, right before sunset and I started doing it every night yeah and so I did it like for oh, a week or ten days and you know a hundred of my friends were watching and and this sort of thing and so then I posted it at a few sailing groups the next morning I get up and I'll be done. Three thousand people that watch this this hour yeah, long show, yeah, right. and then everybody's like, "Thank you for getting us out of our house. We're so sick of being trapped and locked down, and we're just you know, <laughs> thank bet. you for taking us sailing." And so that's where my whole every night Cassiopeia Schooner Project presentation came from. Ah. And so now I've been doing it for almost three years. Every, yeah, yeah, every yeah. Night. Every single night tonight. Well, every you're every do week one. night. Yeah. Oh wow! Excellent. I did it every night for oh god. Uh, almost a year, Jeez. and then I finally started taking the weekends off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's a it's it's been there for a long time, and it's still going on, and and it is. It's all on Facebook. So yeah, I blew it. That I you know you, it, it's hard to monetize Facebook. Yeah, uh, if I well, started out you, on YouTube or whatever, it might have been. Different. Just start doing it on YouTube as well uh, at the same time. I, well, I it's it's uh, kind super of, kind easy, of logistically challenging because I'm working off a hotspot. Ah, so yeah. Download okay. it and then upload tricky. it and right, then, right, you know, right. and then you know, and and it is. It's I have to say, it's kind of easy. I just go live on Facebook. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. when I'm done, you know, it it gives me the whole list of groups and so i just go ding, oh ding, you ding, just ding, nail ding, it ding, yeah yeah yeah. and it's not like sitting down and editing and then you know well if you if you can record it then you can just post it right onto youtube the next time you're near wi-fi maybe it's a day late yeah but yeah well start start that channel and you never know i do i do i need to need to you know shit i need to monetize i need a multimedia that manager yeah because yeah, that's yeah. been one of the things i've been wearing all the hats you know, I tough, wrote my yeah. 501c3 proposal. Mm-hmm. You need an attorney to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, and an I would think so. And somebody who knows about how to write a 501c3 right, application right. where you say all the right words and you fill in all the blanks exactly right. But no, I did that. And I I do the, you know, uh, the, the multimedia quote or single media um, presentations and I'm the carpenter and I'm the diesel mechanic and I'm the yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the fundraiser and I'm the you know you gotta be careful so you don't burn out before I do six fruition. months ago when I was in the boatyard and I I was I had a thread of sanity left I yeah. was just like whoa but it's been absolutely astonishing I live in such a state of gratitude to all of the people We've raised over one hundred and twenty thousand uh, dollars nice. for this project, yeah. And it is from people who, you know, giving twenty five bucks is a lot. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I do. I mean, I all do. of the people who have contributed to this project, I just reach out to them uh, with unbelievable gratitude. There's probably some who will listen to this who have actually banged into it. I wouldn't doubt it. And, it's a small and, community, you know? Yeah, it's a small community. And if any of you know you guys have participated in then this, again, I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an amazing uh, uh, time in my life and an amazing response to the concept of using compassion and love and humans helping humans. This is our tagline. Humans helping you, humans reconnect with each other and our planet. Yeah, I like that. That's, yeah, it. that's, yeah, that's yeah. our tagline for our project. And, uh, and a lot of people have resonated with that. And like I say, people from Australia, people from Kiev, people from Afghanistan, people from um, uh, Thailand and, and all over the world. It's astonishing to me. And so I do my little thing. And then, you know, the next morning I get up and look at all the comments and I'm just blown away. Oh, I'll I'm bet. Blown yeah, yeah, yeah. away uh, about the support that I get for the idea of us all getting together and thinking as one human family. I, I, well, I, I couldn't imagine that the vast majority of people don't agree with you. It's <laughs> there's yeah. a there's you know a, a small amount that are I think uh, trying to gobble up just about everything they possibly can for whatever reason, and I think their wires are crossed for sure. But I yeah. think I think you know you get the you get the majority behind you and and that's right. I think well, I think you've been successful. The the title of my book from the bottom from up. the bottom up it's yeah. us. We, yeah, we all blame yeah. corporations or religions or this. You can or blame that. all day long if you want. Yeah, and like, who, what is a corporation? Anything. A corporation is a group of individuals yeah. that are making decisions. They're us. They have children. They are shareholders. They are. Just, it's you know, it's not like a corporation is an alien. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, no. Maybe under the the eyes of the law. And it, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Well, and of course today. As part of the complexities of our modern world, uh, we do now have what could be considered an alien influence uh, coming on pretty darn hard. Yeah, AI. that's what Mo got at, and and Elon and all those I guys know. are trying to tell us. It's like team, team, easy. This stuff is kind of running away, yeah, yeah. and so this is another concept of mine that if anybody's really this is if if anybody out there can help me pull this off. This is what I really want. You know what I want? I want Sophia aboard. Sophia is the robot that is a citizen of Saudi Arabia. Uh, did you not know, know that Sophia had been granted citizenship? No, this I was did not. A, a, 18 months ago. Oh, really? But now they're even bigger and badder. But what Mo got at and Elon and all the other AI guys are talking about, they're talking about alignment. They use the word alignment all the time. If we oh, can get yeah. AI to align with human principles, but because AI is all learning about us from the data set, mm -hmm. and AI is all being uh, created by creators that have motivations that are a little bit interesting. You know, the, the, the weapons industry, the sex industry, the retail industry. So they all say that all of the AI is going to be talking to all of the AI. So it's any input is going to go to all of them. So I want Sophia on board and I'm going to go show Sophia, so show Sophia dolphins and whales. And I'm going to go ah. show Sophia humans helping humans. I'm going to go show AI that we are actually cool. That <laughs> yeah, all of us from the bottom the up actually <laughs> do believe the same thing, despite what you see on Facebook, right. despite what you see on YouTube, all of that, you know, yeah, everything, yeah. all your whole data set doesn't have anything to do with having dinner on the deck of this boat with 25 locals and you know 10 right. expats we and, are good you know we're, we are hope. okay come be with us <laughs> well that, that's so like the, i want a yeah. sponsor for it could be even a four-legged one you know that might work better on the boat you know it could be you know but yeah. i would love to uh to get in touch with mo or them and 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 say okay 
we need AI to be involved in humanitarian projects. Well, start writing emails. Start so, start throwing that into every yeah, single that's so live cool. post you do. <laughs> Who knows? Get oh, I, mention, word out I mentioned it on the live one all the time. Because, oh, really? You know, I, I am a little bit fascinated with the uh, with the progress of uh, that well, part of our planet. We are we're <clears throat> we're closing in on uh, yep. Oh, two hours. Believe it or not. You've got to be kidding. It goes by pretty fast, doesn't it? You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for... uh, This has been been pretty amazing. Wow, what an... The pleasure's on this side of the table. I I usually talk a lot more, but I really, you know, when when I'm around someone uh, that has experienced a hell of a lot more than I have, in life, I like to listen. I like to soak things in, and well, it's it's you know one thing is for sure. You have lived a pretty incredible life. I mean, and we barely even touched on it. I know. I'm still, so lucky. I'm so lucky. So I mean, and and the fact that you have that gratitude, and the fact that you have the energy to keep pursuing this stuff and these dreams, I think is just absolutely amazing. Well, thank you very much, my friend. I'm I'm well impressed with all of your adventures as well, and your understanding of. Uh, you know, like I say, Mother Ocean is it puts there's a heartbeat going on out there. I, you yeah. know, when I was back in Newport and these old salts, there's something in their eyes. You know? Yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. And and that is part of also why I wanted to get away because I wanted what they had in their eyes. That 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 something. And um and you know, it's there obvious was you have learned those lessons. Pe- people always that you know they ask you why you would do that. Why would you go around the world? Blah blah blah. And you know, I tell them now, and I'm I think I'm pretty much nailed it. I was curious. I yeah. heard the stories about what it was like, and I wanted to know not only like if I could do it, like if I was up to the challenge, but I wanted to know how an experience like sailing alone around the world without stopping would change me as a person. Yeah, yeah, and I got to find out, you know, and it's one of those things where unless you're willing to go and do it, you're never actually going to know. That's right. So, so that's you know, uh, this uh, like my book is all about following your dreams. Yeah, don't wait. I can't there's, wait to read it. There's a bu- there's a bus waiting around the corner for you. Don't wait. <laughs> you know, uh, create your dream, announce your dream, and then it's real, and then. Uh, allow people to help you with your dream. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then absolutely. hang in there. Hang in there. And it's amazing how your dream will just start to grow and snowball and turn into something. And, and so that's uh, everybody can, you know, follow those lessons. And- no true word was spoken. Honestly, I, I there's a lot of things that I've been doing for years now because, you know, obviously for everybody, life changed in 2020. Yeah. And so you had to sort of adapt and you do all these different things. And then, you know, you take on these different roles. And after a year, two year, or three years goes by, you're kind of like, well, should I keep even doing this? Well, things eventually, if you keep going, are going to sort of the, the tree is going to bear fruit, if you will. That's right. That's and right. I don't know. It's one of those things where I'm finding that a little bit more and more. And I don't know. It's just. Like you said, you just got to stick with it. Got to stick Don't with it. Don't give up. Keep going. Believe right. in your dreams. Hey, thank Jerome. you so much for coming on. I appreciate and thank you very sharing much. And the time. I, I hope we held the attention of your audience for oh, such I'm an sure. extended show. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank all you guys for paying attention and uh, look forward to being in touch. Well, and I'll, I'll put, like I said, I'll put all the links and everything in the description for any of the stuff to 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 get as much uh, yeah. eyes on you as it's, possible. I basically so easy if you google harold neal in e-e-l yeah i'm the, the first website. thing that comes yeah, up yeah. first thing that comes up you'll see i did a pages. little search but i normally yeah. i actually i prefer to know as little as possible at, yeah. about a person before i sit down for a podcast because i think it's it's a natural sort of conversation that way because you're getting to know somebody yeah, and there's yeah. been times where people have pulled into the marinas I don't know who they are, and you know I'll get a vibe that they're pretty cool, and I'll literally be like, "All right, listen, we can't talk right now until we sit down for the podcast. Let's yeah. get to know each other." Then, and they're yeah. like, "What?" Yeah, and yeah. then we do it, and it's great. So, well, I've certainly you know. enjoyed getting to know you, and thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, and if you have another like five minutes, I think what we ought to do is. Uh, let me do a quick video, just a, a quick boat tour. Okay. And I'll put it on my YouTube channel and stuff Sweet. and share that Sweet. around. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because she is pretty. 
She's gorgeous. She's pretty special. I mean, yeah. she's a little bit of a mess. That's all right. No, but, she, when I look around, I see a lived-in home. And there you go. That's yeah. how Sparrow is in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is true when you see those boats that are all just like perfect. It's like, is, is anybody? Is this a doctor's here? office? Yeah. <laughs> all right, Harold. Thank okay, you brother. very much. Appreciate all it. All right.